I get the sense that a lot of people think about the offensive value first for these kinds of games. And sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, and, and we can also coach defense with this, too. Um, what's your kind of general philosophy for these defensive small side of games? Yeah, what, what a great question. Interesting question for me, too, because it's uh, whenever you told me the topic of defense, I'm like, hey, let's go. I am probably labeled more as an offensive coach. What I'm most passionate about is exactly what you said. It's principle based teaching that allows you to teach offense and defense at the same time. So, uh, yes, some of these small sided games that we're going to share, we really play these games to train basketball because we're coaching basketball. We don't just coach offense. We don't just coach defense, but we're going to look at it through a defensive lens. And I think the way I would approach this as a coach is think about why you're playing this game. Too many times when we're planning practice, we think, what drills are we going to do today? And I think that is very coach centered. And I think that comes from a place of human nature of, hey, what would we look good doing today? rather than what do we need to work on? What do we struggle with? What are we preparing for? And then that guide, what games you play. So some of these games we're going to dive into, you could play the exact same game with an offensive lens uh, to train, you know, a certain concept or skill on the offensive side or play the exact same game and train something on the defensive side. And the value in that is you don't have to have a thousand different drills or games, you have one game, but you as the coach manipulate, shape the environment to where you're training certain aspects of either your offensive and defensive. So when I say principle-based teaching, something like spacing is a principle on offense. If we value space, then defense, how do we constrict space, right? Or if offense, we value ball movement on defense, how do we slow down or disrupt the offense's ball movement? That way, it's very easy to two-way teach. Uh, it's that paradox of the game, the yin and yang. If on the offensive side, we value this, then defensively, we're taking it away. I think if you approach the game that way, it becomes, one, simpler to teach, but also easier to train and two-way teach where you don't have to block. This is our offensive game that we're playing. This is our defensive game that we're playing. Maybe we talk about this next time. It's a little bit out of order. I didn't think far enough ahead, but we just got done talking the last two episodes about like principles of play and then what that looks like fleshed out, maybe talking about principles of play on the defensive side. Uh, and you can touch on those a little bit, but we'll save that primarily for next time. What, one more before we get to the film, but how does your overall defensive system impact how you design these games? Our overall defensive system could change the design based on what, how we score it. Sometimes by changing what a win is for offense, you can train what we're trying to accomplish defensively. So probably a better way to explain that would be an example. We're going to start when we get into the video with some one-on-one -on -one games. If we're trying to, let's, let's use lock left as an example. The goal of lock left is to get the ball in jail. If we say offense, you're going to start here your goal is to get a right-handed drive into the paint. But we're removing the scoring function of the drill uh, just so now offense has a very clear objective. Try to get a right-handed drive into the paint uh, where we don't distract offense with, hey, can I get a shot off? And they might intentionally go left because that's where our defense is steering us. Uh, so, yeah, I would say our defensive system will choose how we score the drill what constraints that we add. And then anytime we're looking to train defense, you're actually going to constrain the offense. So in that example, there is like, we're trying to train defense to put them in jail. So we're adding a constraint to the offense. I think that is where maybe some coaches uh, need some clarification on it. We're actually, we'll, we'll get to that in the one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's a great place to start for us. But yeah, if you want to work offense, add a defensive constraint. If you want to work defense, add an offensive constraint. Great. Okay, let's go ahead and then transition to the film. So we're going to pull this up. Coach, I'll just let you take control of this, and I may jump in, but you go ahead and start wherever you want. Yeah, feel free to jump in. Interruptions are good. So first, this is a great example of a constraint. So in this game, we are one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, the player in the black jersey has no dribbles. So our defender in orange, what we're training since offense does not have any dribbles, is showing the ref our hands. We're moving our feet. Uh, with chesting the ball, uh, and we're not going for fakes. So we're working, we're training, not fouling, how to create contact in the paint, 
Um, I like external cues, especially when, when guarding the ball. So our external cue here, instead of just saying hands up, hands up, hands up, we would say palms to the ceiling. That way we can actually see when we're watching film, or were your palms to the ceiling or did they come down and face the floor? That's usually when we would foul. So this first game is what we would call one-on-one, -on -one, no dribble. I'm going to fight the urge for the rest of this episode to not talk offense, but this is a great way to teach players how to shy fake, how to pivot. Um, so to go back to your first question is like, this is how we're working both is we're training basketball habits, right? Defense is working on staying down on shot fakes and pivots. If we take the dribble away, now we're leaving the offense with shot fakes and pivots. So we kind of get what we want there uh, by shaping both the offensive and defensive side. This next game, and this is another one-on-one -on -one game. I kind of I kind of segmented this as one-on-one, -on -one, two-on-two, three-on-three, four-on-four, and five-on-five. -five. Not necessarily the way we would we would practice it, but I thought it would it'd be a good flow for the uh, for the podcast. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of pause here too, before we get into this next one, there are three types of drills. There's teaching, training, and competing. Cody Toppert, uh, used these three kind of categories that were very similar. In one of his presentations, it was brush your teeth. That's like your routine, you're calibrating, you're, you're getting their mind right. I would use these as warmups. That first drill is kind of a brush your teeth drill. Your water, your plants are you're just getting a lot of reps. It's skill reinforcement, progressive difficulty, where we're living right in between teaching and then all out competition, which is the third bucket uh, where Cody said, sharpen your sword. Full contact, lots of decisions, lots of reads. These would be our full go small sided games or our 515. So I say that the first drill was kind of a brush your teeth, water your plants. This one would be more full contact but we're going to get a little bit extra benefit in here. So this one was just a crowd favorite on Twitter. So I thought it would be a good one to share here. If we want to work one-on-one -on -one guarding the ball, which I think you should do every day. I heard uh, Rick Patino say this years and years ago. And I'm like, gosh, like one-on-one, -on -one, like we got too much team stuff to get to. Like that's uh, that's kind of like playground stuff. And now every coach I talk to, I'm like, hey, how much one-on-one -on -one are you playing? So if we want to play one-on-one -on -one from the catch or off the jab, a great way to start would be from a block out. So player at the basket is in white. They are going to block out. Player on the wing in black, they're an offensive rebounder. Whoever gets the rebound gets to play offense. So player in white got the ball. They're going to throw it to the coach. And then now we just play live one-on-one. -on -one. So it's just a dynamic way to start your live one-on-one. -on -one. And then you can see in this rep, I, I pulled this rep, uh, first, external cue would be airplane defense. When guarding a live dribble, we want to look like an airplane. Everybody knows what an airplane looks like. It's a nice external cue. But at the end of this rep, look what we get. Defense put, picks up their dribble. They pivot. They shot fake. Uh, offense picks up their dribble. Sorry, pivot, shot fake. Defense stays down, gets a rebound. So that first game that we saw really transferred to this game. We'll watch one more. Uh, we call this block out to cut out. Usually pretty competitive because you got to get a rebound to play offense. So if you're a poor rebounder, you're just stuck playing defense this whole one. Uh, could be one you could do every single day. This next one will go to two on two. And I'll, I'll kind of segue this one here because this is a different style of drill. When I'm designing practice, and this goes back to your, your principles of play and the paradox of the game, what we value on offense, we value the opposite on defense. The way I would build my defensive system, the way I would choose what games we play would be in these four categories. Transition defense, how they get layups. So let's look at a defensive lens. How do we take away other teams' layups, which we would call a nine? How do we take away their threes, which we would call sevens, assuming both are big advantage? And then how do we take away they, the stuff that they run? So a lot of these games will have a mix of both, but I will say on offense, we focus more on dominoes as far as advantage basketball and on defense we do as well because i think an underrated skill of great defensive teams are ones that can neutralize an advantage is more stuff they ran okay so we use this two on two game to to prepare this is more scout driven how do we neutralize the actions they run your one-on-ones are how do we eliminate their nines right how do we can we eliminate them driving into the basket for for an open layup if you can't guard the ball you can't guard the rim. 
you can't guard the three because you're going to be bringing two to the ball. And then you can't rebound because you're going to be in rotation. Okay, so we're going to start with how do we take away their nines? How do we take away their sevens? This is more how do we take away the stuff they run? So uh, this is just coaches playing against players from the action spot. So we call this two on two on top. And you can see we're running a variety of different screens and cuts, and we're just working on our coverage. So this would be a ball screen. This was a switch. We're working on switching and getting under. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier was how do we manipulate the scoring system? For this one, you could do um, if coaches get a paint touch, whether it's off the drive or off a cut, uh, that could be a point. Right? And then you could maybe every catch the coaches get going away from the basket would be a point for the defense. So any catch coaches get away going to the basket, that's one point. Any paint touch offense gets, that's one point. And that's the way you can kind of gamify this drill. I don't like shell drill. So a lot of these drills are how we replace shell. This would be a one where uh, instead of just dry running shell and saying, hey, we're going to pass and cut, pass and cut, and no one's looking to score. This is more uh, random. It's more representative of the game where they're going to have to guard several cuts, several screens, keep us out of the paint. It's somewhat live, but again, this is water your plants where we're just getting reps on reps on reps. Okay, So that's more of the stuff they run. This next game is what we call two-on-two -two near man. So a principle or a concept that we have on defense would be we always close out to the most dangerous player. Uh, and we just call that the nearest man, or the nearest girl. On this one, I'm at the top of the key with the ball. We've got two defenders circling in the paint and two offensive players on the wing. They're going to circle up until the ball is thrown out. How we take away sevens is no one shoots where they catch. So this closeout should really be a close off. So the first thing we're training is closing off the line. Said I wasn't going to talk offense, but I'll just sneak it in here. This player on the wing is deciding, do I have a seven? If no seven, I attack closeout, right? So we're working closeout reads and defense is working closing off. If we close someone off, now we're in a help in recovery. So now their goal is to take away nines and sevens. On this middle drive, we see a little help, recovery, and it all starts over. We close off, we take away their seven. When they put it on the floor, our next principle would be every dribble is a pass. So every catch is a dribble, meaning no one shoots where they catch. And every dribble is a pass, meaning if they put it on the floor, we're going to put our chest in front and force a kick out. The best way to eliminate nines and sevens is to eliminate shots. And I might have used this analogy in, in one of our episodes in the past, but I think it bears repeating if I did. If you watch hockey or soccer, I've never seen the defense just allow the other team to shoot and hope that they miss or hope that their goalie does their job. The entire team, the entire possession is trying to eliminate shots. And I think that's where basketball defenses could change their design. I see a lot of defenses where if we're choppy hands or choppy feet, high hands on a closeout, or we're relying on contesting shots at the rim, you're allowing shots. And I, in an invasion sport, you should eliminate shots at all at all costs. So every dribble is a pass. That should have been a close off. And then we finish with a rebound. I think we got one more rep here. This is one of my favorite ways to introduce 0.5 to offense and our nines and sevens on D. So we get a really nice close off. Help comes. And then now we're in another close off. So offense is usually at a big advantage here. If we want to train defense, we put offense at an advantage uh, because you're always going to force help and rotation. Really, really great way to teach peel switching as well. And then every time that there's a perimeter shot, you get a nice rebounding opportunity. Tony, before we go three on three, I know that's a lot. Any questions on one on one or two on two games? Does the frequency of feedback change based off of what kind of game that you're playing? Great question. Absolutely. If there's a teaching, and I would say more teaching would be drill-based, right? We're teaching or introducing a new concept. There's going to be a lot of feedback, a lot of demonstration. That's why we don't like drills as much because they're not as representative. It's a lot of walkthrough, but sometimes that's necessary, right? When teaching a new skill, lots of feedback, 
lots of reinforcement, lots of demonstration on your teaching. Your training, I've found a lot of value in keeping your buzzwords. So in that last drill near man, when the ball is kicked out, I might say close off just to give that reminder. Whenever the ball is put on the floor, I might say chest in front. Uh, so we're constantly cueing them with buzzwords or reminders. And then when we're full live, I would say don't say anything. Very little feedback, if any. I think if you're giving feedback during live play, you're training them to do one of two things and neither one of them are good. First one, you're training them not to get to the next play because all of your feedback is going to be communicating what happened on the previous rep, which means you're taking their mind off the next play, which coaches are obsessive of saying next play, or you're training them not to listen to you. Because if you're talking to me about the last rep, but I'm on to the next play, I can't do both, right? It's the old, we can't multitask. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. So a game like uh, the two on two on top where coaches were playing against players, uh, I would give a lot of buzzwords and reminders. In fact, if I get a catch and let's say you're supposed to be locking me left and your foot angle is not correct, I might just stop live play and say, hey, fix your foot angle. Where's jail? Once they adjust their angle, now we're back live. In a game like this that we call three on three, no help, I would give very little feedback. Um, maybe some reminders, but not feedback, meaning uh, if somebody made a mistake, I'm not going to address that mistake until after in a debrief. I mentioned this game is called three on three, no help. This was a um, one I had to kind of convince myself to do because I don't like not working help defense because I love help defense. But this is a way to train your ball on ball defense, which is the most important part of defense. In fact, I would consider calling the on ball de defender the MIG, the most important guy or the most important girl. I've heard some people refer to the the low man or the goalie as the, the most important player. But just like on offense, if we have the ball in our hands, the program's in our hands. On defense, you're guarding the program, right? You're defending the program. So I'd make them the MIG. You basically have a series of one-on-one -on -one games going all around the court. So if I'm guarding the ball in a lock left system, it's my job is to put them in jail. Uh, maybe in a pressure system, my number one job would be don't get beat. My number two job would be pressure as much as I can without violating rule number one. And these other players that are one pass away as we're working our gap principles or our deny principles uh, where we're making no easy catches, right? We're trying to isolate the ball from their teammates. Great way to work stunning or skirmishing one pass away as well, which would be another way we eliminate nines, right? We we guard the ball, no straight line drives, and then we cause indecision with stunts. The way I build defense would be from the ball out. So if we're guarding the ball, we're going to take care of those core principles on guarding the ball. Then we would move to our principles of one pass away, which also would include post defense, right? So now we're working those first two on ball um, and one pass away, where every time your player has the ball, you are just in a one-on-one -on -one battle. I love this one because we can't rely on help. Uh, in the past, our teams have been so good at help. Sometimes we just funnel them to the help instead of taking pride in our own ball defense. Um, and it's a really nice way. Hopefully you're one of those coaches that has adopted um, or will adopt not helping ball side. Great way to reinforce those as well. Uh, and then when I would use this would be preparing for a team that's just going to spread you out and drive and kick you. So how do they get their nines and sevens? It's really just a lot of drive and kick. Do not have to guard a lot of action. I would lean on this game again, three on three, no help. Next one. So we got uh, two four on fours, and then I'll leave you with a five on five. I mentioned how to replace shell drill. In all of these games that we've shared, they've had elements of shell, right? Regarding the drive, regarding some actions. It's just a more live environment. We can always script a rotation that we want to train while making it live or at least a what we would call a script to live so in this game we call it 414 uh it, it's two ball cover down so here's the setup we've got a white team on o we've got the team in black on d and if you notice on the baseline i've got a, a coach here in a white shirt with a ball and a coach here in an orange shirt with a ball i'm going to show you what their role is in the game here's the script we pass it guard the guard guard the wing and we have to start with a baseline drive so we drive at baseline, we help over, we help down. If this baseline drift pass gets through, 
we're live. And right now we're working defensive rotation. No one shoots where they catch, take away their nines and sevens, et cetera. We're working on our rotation in order to get neutral after a disadvantage situation. If we get a deflection, which we do on this rep, the coach on that side, so the coach in orange, is kicking a new ball out, and we near man. So now we're taking the two-on-two near man, near man game principles and transferring them to this four-on-four -four game. I like adding the second ball because it teaches multiple efforts, right? We've got a scramble. We've got a play. Once we do this, it's just completely four-on-four -four live. Usually offense is going to get into drive and kick game because they're at an advantage, which you're getting all the benefits you would out of shell drill. But this is a live game that's much more representative uh, to the game that you're going to play um, on your schedule, right? So the more representative that we can make practice, the more it transfers to game. Uh, we'll watch one more script here. So guard the guard, guard the wing, baseline drive. If that pass gets through, we're live. We get a deflection, so the coach in the white kicks it anywhere, and then we have to learn our rotations out. Uh, so this was a fun one. Um, players enjoy this, and it's a way where you can, if you're hesitant to get rid of shell drill altogether, this is a way you can sneak it in and get live play. All right, this next one, four-on-four four cutthroat, uh, probably one most coaches are familiar with. This is the absolute best bang for your buck. You could run you could play cutthroat every single day at practice and like we mentioned at the top change the constraint or change what the violation would be in this game so here's what cutthroat is we have three teams we have a, a yellow team on d we have a white team on o and we have a black team at half so i like to play this with three teams of four the coach is going to pick one violation which is going to remove the defense that's important because you can only score points on the defensive end the way you score points is by getting a rebound or a stop of some sort. Anytime we violate, meaning in this game, we said any missed block out is a violation. So if I shoot a shot and none of, one of these defenders does not block out or at least check who their player they're guarding is to see if they're going, we're just going to blow the whistle and say off, didn't block out. White team goes to D. Black team goes to O. Again, you can only score on defense, so you want to stay on defense as much as possible to win the game, which is another way where we would uh, change the constraints or the violations dependent on our um, system. So if we were playing in lock left, we could say any right-hand drive is a violation. So if offense got to their right hand, we would just blow the whistle, stop the possession there immediately, and we would rotate. So if we watch this possession, Blacks on O, Really, if you're if you're on offense, your goal is just to get shots, right? Because if you get a shot and defense doesn't block out, you get to go to defense and score points. So in this last rep here, you'll start to see the light bulb go off for these players. I think it's this rep where they start to miss a block out, and you could see the aha moment of I've got to stop and go block out. So I think it's on this drive here. All right, I want you to watch this player guarding the player near the elbow here. He's going to start to run away. And then she's going to correct herself and come block out here. You can see we're, we did a pretty good job of going four for four on this. This is, when I say best bang for your buck, if you can pick one thing to train, uh, it is the number one way to get a defensive concept or really an offensive concept too to trans translate to live play. Typically, when we do drills, if we did a rebounding or block out drill, we might block out in the drill. And the second we go live, all that goes away. As a coach, we've all been there before. So why we run these small sided games with these constraints or these violations is to get what we want in live play, which is what we want in the game. Another constraint that I love and in, in, or a violation and cutthroat that I like would be uh, jumping to the ball. And I think just with the coaches that I've watched film on in this past year as a consultant, most coaches that are trying to fix their defense are neglecting their team's ability to jump to the ball. So important, especially if you're going to be principle-based of if we're just in the right position, we can guard everything because we have a way to guard everything, right? If we're switching, if we don't jump to the ball, we're going to be out of position to switch. So that would be another one. I mentioned your foot angles on the ball are not allowing a drive to a, to a place where you don't want uh, and then on the offensive side, it could be 
a full speed cut or angle of ball screen, right? Or like setting up a ball screen is one we would use. So we're going to play four on four. If we don't set up our ball screen, it's a violation. You don't get to play offense anymore. So one of my faves, I'm sure coaches are familiar. I would say the challenge with coaches on this one is that they try to uh, hold their teams accountable for too many things in this game. I would limit it to one and only one violation. Uh, not even an offensive one and a defensive one. Just pick one side of the ball and go with that. Two comments and then one clarification. Give you a chance to get some water. I can't agree more in regards to like emphasizing too many things during these games. I had a group of players that there was this attitude of like there were so many things that they kind of you could tell that they mentally just threw them all out. It was essentially like I'm bound to do something I'm supposed to get a, a point for. So I'm just going to hoop. And there was no emphasis then on anything. And then, like you said, no transfer to the other thing. So keeping those things limited, uh, they just don't know what's important. The second thing is I love, we have a game that's a five on five. We we just call it, you know, hunting turkeys because we're trying to get the three stops in a row. And I've mentioned it on several different platforms before, even here, probably on the podcast, but it rewards defense and it encourages them to get to defense as quickly as possible, which it goes contrary to every part of a player's being like they want to play offense. And what I actually found was it fine tuned our offense because teams we were taking better shots. Guys were holding each other even more accountable to take better shots, to not make a turnover because they knew that then they could go to defense. And that was the only way that you could score a point was by being on defense anyways. So there was a sharpening of our offense, even though everybody knew it was primarily a defensive drill. I think that's the test of a great, you know, small sided game is that you do train both things, but there may be an emphasis on one side of the ball, but it really is training both sides of the ball. And then just your opinion, clarification. I even saw this this week, a comment about the rebounding. I think you already kind of gave your opinion about it, but there was a comment that was made rebounding we work on it we get you know we rebound average 12 13 rebounds a game on one side of the ball or whatever we don't work on it we average 12 13 rebounds on one side of the ball i don't know why i should work on it anyways i personally i, I don't buy that i think that like you got lucky and you had good rebounders on your team it didn't matter if you're going to practice it or not may have been height may have been pursuit of the ball whatever but i do think that you can get better at it and i think you can get better at by doing what you just mentioned but you just your opinion and your own words about that if I was talking to that coach, I'd say, well, it's very result driven. You know, like you said, the game where or, or the season or game where you don't work on it, you get the same amount of rebounds. Well, what did the other team do? Were they were they, you know, the five, five and under team that you're going to play or uh, do they not go after offensive rebounds? Maybe they're more of a transition based team. And then also you're going to get rebounds just because the ball is going to going to bounce your way. Uh, I would say rebounding is such an important part of the game you know it's it's one of the four factors it's an important metric in winning and losing if you're not working on it or training it in some aspect i, I think you're you're asking for trouble along the way because at some point you will be exposed on the boards uh and i also think you know like that same coach that's saying we shouldn't um practice rebounding is probably preaching toughness too and I don't know that you can be a tough team and and um, and not rebound the ball, right? There's just that certain level of toughness in, in two ways. One, the level of physicality, but also I think toughness is getting your teams to play harder for longer. Like, can we can we play harder for three more seconds on every possession? Meaning, shot goes up, we don't quit, right? We go defensively, we go hit somebody that's that's coming in for the for an offensive rebound. We hold our block out, whatever your philosophy is. And then offensively, can we make multiple efforts to pursue an offensive rebound? And then after the rebound, can we sprint either on defensive transition or offensive transition? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just think the toughness piece, the rebounding piece, really important. You're going to get exposed if you don't work on it. Uh, and uh, there's an old adage that I like is, uh, you know, you can't eat seven apples on Sunday. The old, the old saying of an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It's like, if you get to that certain point of your season where it's like, oh, we haven't worked rebounding, let's work on it a lot. Uh, it's probably too late uh, in your season. Um, and then I'll, you had a couple, couple great points. You mentioned having too many things as the, the emphasis in cutthroat. There's been times where we only have one thing and I've got to stop halfway through the game and say, hey, what's the violation? And some of them are looking around like, what? We're not just playing four on four. Right. So uh, even when you have one, you still have to remind. 
you you mentioned like the you know having too many things i would also caution coaches of having too many objectives in practice in general just we're working on x y and z on offense we're working on abc on defense we also want to install this press break and uh, when you do that it's just really really hard to walk away from those practices and say like gosh we got really good at this today so yeah i, I would say the fewer things you're working on at practice and going deeper in those you'll see a ton of benefit more so than trying to to chase too many rabbits i got two more two more games for you one with video and the other one we'll just talk through because we don't need video for it so this one is borrowed from michigan women this borrows the near man concept but also values guarding the ball so the way this one is is set up is you have a line of defenders underneath the basket you have a line of offensive players uh, at the top of the key defense throws the ball out and we're playing live one-on-one -on -one. and you can limit the amount of dribbles for offense you can uh, maybe put a three to four or five second shot clock on them but we're gonna have a moment of one-on-one -on -one to start this game if we get leveled off we pick up our dribble we're going to kick to the next player in line. So this should be a near man closeout in this rep. Maybe this player should have left. Maybe they were the nearest. Maybe this player underneath the basket said, I got ball. Usually the first person to talk is right. The second one listens. So we get another closeout. We play live two on two on this kick. You can see the player that was guarding the initial driver here is now going to take the ball. That's the near man. So we're working our defensive rotations in order to neutralize an advantage and then we just build up to four on four so now we have another close out now we're four on four and then the last one we're five on five and now we're just completely live obviously we're not gonna play six on six um after that if you want to get you know this is a kind of a scout team here for michigan if you want them to run a specific action or, or a scout oh you could uh but if you're just playing you know your players versus your players like this next rep, then we're just going completely live. I love that build up there. I think it was a unique way to build up to five on five. Um, also, great way to simulate help in rotation without um, starting offense at an advantage, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like an advantage to neutral drill. Um, the closeout gives you the advantage. Can we get neutral? So that's my five on five game. I'll give you one more that you could play five on five, four on four, three on three. Uh, doesn't matter. Uh, it's more of a, a scoring system and it's the knockout game. We could play live. Let's say it's five on five. We're playing live and we're going to score by twos and threes to eight points, which is a favorite of mine because it, it only takes five or so minutes for a game to end. You could play to five by ones and twos to really value the three but you're gonna give each team a knockout punch and that might be a specific action uh, that the offense would run. So if let's say offense, we could have the knockout punch of a ball screen and if the roller scores, that's the knockout punch, game's gonna be over. I would play that one if we really wanted to emphasize defense tagging the roll, right? Or whatever our coverage is, if we're switching, maybe switching and going under. Uh, to get underneath that role. So tons of different knockouts that you can you can create. I would say connect some of your other small-sided games, like the two-on-two -on, -two on top where coaches are playing against D. If we're going to work on, you know, let's say the knockout is a DHO. If we score off a DHO, that's the knockout punch. Then earlier in that practice, let's play two-on-two -on, -two on top or two-on-two -on, -two on a side with a ton of DHOs just so we're training. You know, we're, we're watering our plants until we get to the sharpen our sword for the competitive part. So honestly, I think you could take all these games, the one-on-one -on -one through five-on-five -on -five, and only have those in your drill library and probably touch on everything. I'd say the misses for me as far as designing these would be just like a, a big disadvantage game for defense, meaning there's four offensive players and three defenders just so we're getting a lot of help in rotation. We still got them in the games that we shared, but um, those are all also great two-way teachers where offense is training dominoes 0.5, defense is training defensive rotation trying to get neutral.